Welcome to Room Service. I'm Sarah Richardson. Have you ever wanted to decorate the nursery in something other than pink and blue? We'll use neutrals to make this spare room a cozy haven for baby as we find a new use for a standard dresser, meet an artisan who creates whimsy and fun for little ones, and by making artwork that's as easy as A, B, C. We'll show you that neutrals are the natural choice for the nursery, and it's only on room service. I bet that when I say the word nursery, the first colors that come to your mind are pink and yellow and green and blue, ducks and bunnies and flowers. Well, I'm taking on a slightly different challenge for this nursery. The clients have requested that we do a nursery scheme that is in keeping with the rest of the house. The style that we're trying to accomplish is uh, somewhat clean lines, neutral palettes. Nothing that's white or very much frou-frou looking. We'll work with some dark woods. We will replace this sort of lemon whip yellow with a softer, light, light, light tan. I'm thinking about doing some sort of paint technique, but I haven't quite figured that out yet. As far as furniture placement goes, the room is a relatively small size. It's about 10 by 12, an average size for a nursery or a small child's bedroom. So I think we'll put the crib back in this corner where it'll be nestled away and away from any direct light because after all we want to encourage good night's sleeps. Then we'll put the change table here so you'll see just as you walk in it'll be important to pick a piece of furniture that looks really nice for this because it's right off the hall. We'll put the glider over in this corner with a standing floor lamp. This is great. It gets west light coming in and we want to make sure that we keep an open floor plan so that when the baby grows up and becomes a toddler there's enough room to play in this room. So a soft carpet will be key and we'll be working with a mostly neutral palette. I'm thinking one or two colors for a little bit of accent, a little bit of punch, but overall we'll be making it natural, neutral, and a nurturing, welcoming space to come home to. How do you create a nursery that is a quiet and calm place for a newborn? We're taking our cues from some of nature's most basic offerings. Milk white, rich and creamy is the starting point for keeping it light. Then we're looking for comfort. A steaming bowl of oatmeal provides the essence for a neutral scheme in shades of warmth. Then we'll add just a kick of color, a touch of energy in an otherwise subdued scheme. And this nursery will be ready for life's challenges. for a change table to use in our nursery. I've been to all of my regular haunts in search of kids' furniture, but I seem to have come up empty-handed. So now I've decided to go slightly farther afield. I'm in the warehouse district. You'll see some interesting statues, and I'm gonna look at something a little bit out of the ordinary. I'm gonna look into whether I might be able to find something Indonesian that could work in our nursery. Let's see. Now, just because I said I was looking for items for the nursery doesn't mean that I can't also have my eyes open to see what else might appeal for other spaces. Take these tables, for example. They are a slice of root, and they have just a rustic leg on them. Very simple construction. They have a waxed finish. I think that pieces like this could be a natural complement to a really modern interior. To me, they seem reminiscent of pieces by George Nakashima, who was a Japanese furniture maker. Uh, though they are at about, mm, I don't know, one one hundredth of the price. Great price point, interesting piece. Let's see what else they have to offer. Part of the thing about being in the warehouse district is, I don't know what they're moving around upstairs, but it is a noisy day in here. 
Uh, here's a bench, another piece that is great in many different settings. It could be ideal at the end of a bed. Uh, this is actually a Chinese piece. I like the simple line of it. We just have a small turned detail here. The light wood is a good complement for uh, rustic pine. Other, It mixes well with other wood colors as well. So this could be used as an entry bench at the foot of a bed. Again, a flexible piece that has an interesting flair to it. Still staying focused, looking for the nursery, aha! Now this is something that you don't see every day. I'd call this bejeweled and bedazzled. This is a silk coverlet all done with gold sequins and hand embroidery. Not exactly what we're looking for for our nursery, but if you wanted to make a strong impact, you could always go with something like this. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this chest that's at the foot of the bed looks to me like it just might be the thing for us. We've got lots of drawers here, six drawers in total. You can see the fronts of the drawers all have an inset woven panel, so that works well with our natural theme, still creating a little bit of interest. We've got an overall dark stained wood color, simple lines, very simple legs, and I think it will be just um, a bit more unusual complement for the crib and the other pieces of furniture that are the, in the room without seeming too babyish. The only thing it's missing is a change table on top, but that's something that I can easily get made, something that is removable so that later on this piece could be repurposed in just about any other area of the house. And I think that this is just the thing. So we'll wrap it up and take it with us. Next on Room Service, we'll see how the rest of our furniture is coming together and meet the maker of some tactile art. Change is underway in this little room. Bye bye guest room and hello nursery. As you can see, I've started out by painting the walls. Always a good first step. I've done a wide horizontal stripe treatment and it carries all the way around the room. Very, very simple to do. The first step is to paint the walls in the lighter color. So walls and ceiling are done in a light creamy tan kind of shade and that's painted overall. Next step is to just use painter's masking tape and stripe off the two wide bands and then I've painted them using this sort of deeper tan color. It's an effective treatment. It's really graphic but very simple and bold at the same time and it's definitely going to work with our neutral scheme. As you can see we've also replaced the bed with a crib. I'm not sure that this is exactly where it's going to stay. I may put across this wall instead but you will see that I chose to go with a dark mahogany finish on this crib. Now, I've brought in a glider, and there is no way I can tell you that this is the most beautiful piece of furniture in the world, because it's not, but I'm told that it is the most comfortable. And what we're gonna do is, we are going to put a slip cover on these uh, paddings. This is just the standard covering that the chair came with, and you can definitely add on your own covering to tie it into the concept of your room, because these panels just snap on, which is great. As you can see here, this is a star light fixture, which I've purchased to go on the ceiling instead of the little globe that's there. We want something that doesn't have a light bulb that shines straight down because we don't want it shining in baby's eyes. So this will give a very soft glow to the room. We'll put it on a dimmer so that it can be dimmed right down and left on all night long just to create that sort of feeling of warmth. I've also picked up a carpet, again, in our neutral color palette. This is 100% wool and it's got squares on it that tie in sort of a good complement to the striped wall treatment and it's a soft carpet so it'll be a good play space for the baby. What's not here yet is the change table. Change table pad, you just have to use your powers of imagination. It will be here shortly and it'll help to tie in with the rest of the concept as will all the decorative accessories. We still have a long way to go but we're starting to make this a warm and cozy little place for the baby. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required.
When designing a baby's room, drapes are always high on the priority list. Here's what I've chosen for this nursery. I've started out by using a pair of swing arm rods. They have a pewter finish, and the advantage to these rods is that they are extendable, so you can widen them or shorten them depending on the width of your window. Next, I've chosen to go with a flat panel drape. It has a pocket across the top that just slips over the rod. Then I've sewn in a series of pleats all the way down the face of it, just to give it a little bit of texture and interest. When the drapes are closed, they have the look of European shutters, and this will ensure that our wee tiny baby client will have a good night's sleep. Designing a nursery to meet the needs of your newborn while still maintaining your home's contemporary style and neutral palette isn't easy. Designer Heather Shaw has mastered this feat by using natural materials and earthy tones for accessories that create a serene and nurturing environment for any child. I'd always known I was going to make things for a living. My sister had a baby. I had to make things for them. I've always made all my gifts, so people were then interested in the things that I'd made for them and it just evolved. I started making things for kids out of necessity and I'm enjoying it I think more in some ways. I started by making the alphabet wall hanging. That has evolved, it's still evolving. I'm still coming up with new and better things to use for the different letters. And then for the wall hangs, we've chosen the eight most popular and ones that we like the best and every show or every year I keep adding one more. I'd say the two most popular are the bear and the fairy, and there's no way around that because people are attracted to whatever is really cute and just can't help themselves when they see those. The starfish people love for a bathroom as well. I find as many adults are buying them as anything. Heather sources the materials she uses in her creations at antique and textile shows. It's these elements of the past that connect her pieces to the present and to the future. The aesthetic of an old typewriter, the beauty of words, and looking at things in a new way are a big part of her design philosophy. I wish I could remember how I came up with the pocket pillow idea, but I am so glad I did. They say every business has a bread and butter. This is it. I think I was probably putting pockets on things, put the bear in. Again, it was a gift for my, my niece initially, my niece Melissa, and... She loved it and it just evolved, but it's been a, it's been a great thing because they're, they're easy to make and they give people so much pleasure and they're, they've been wonderful. Uh, my second niece, Caitlin, was born and they didn't have anything to hang above her bed, so I made this mobile with angels on it. I took this metallic organza and these little muslin dolls and sewed them into little angels to watch over her and I had little stars hanging in it and then again, you know, just the demand seemed to be out there for people looking for them, so I just started making that, those as well. And we've expanded and now have them with the bears, with wings. So how many were you looking at? Okay, so they come in a linen assortment, ranging sort of from some pastel colors and natural and white. People accuse me of being afraid of using color. I don't think that I am. I think that there's color inherent in everything. So even the subtle earth tones that I'm using have color, it's just more subtle. I think that a child's room should be serene and quiet and nurturing. It should be a room for playing and reflection, but also for bonding between the parents and the child and just being able to go in there and feeling some kind of sanctity and being there. Just a place with visual information that they can take in that makes sense in the world around them that they'll have some connection to. Coming up on Room Service, I'll teach you the ABCs of making your own art for baby. Being a kid is all about learning your ABCs. When I went out looking for artwork for our nursery, I found it a bit of a challenge to find something that coordinated with the neutral scheme. So what I've done is I've devised an alphabet soup canvas. Let me show you how it's done. 
I started out with a regular artist canvas. You can buy these canvases pre-stretched at any art supply store. They come in a variety of sizes, starting at the size of about a postcard and going as big as you could possibly want. This one here is 18 inches square and it has a one and a half inch deep back on it. I like a canvas with a deeper back because it sets it off against the wall and you don't necessarily need to put a frame on it. For this project, I used a three by four foot canvas in a rectangular shape. So far I've just painted it in a neutral tone that coordinates with the paint palette that we have in our nursery so far. This is just regular leftover latex house paint. You can use it either in a flat finish or in an eggshell finish. I've painted the entire canvas including the sides. The next thing I want to do is add some stripes. So I'm using uh, a low tack painter's masking tape and I will go over the edge and you can mark this with a pencil if you want but I like to just make a freehand stripe and you can always check and make sure it's straight very important we'll make these stripes in alternating widths and it's important just to press down sort of burnish the edges of the tape so that the paint won't bleed underneath the tape Now I have two colors of paint that I'm going to use. One is just a cream and the other one is a mix between the base color and the cream. There's really no rules to this. You just want to have colors that are a couple of shades different from your base color so that they show up. But this effect can be as subtle as you want. on to the lighter color which is my cream shade and I'll paint that in the stripes that are left. Now you may think that this looks too subtle to show up right now but I promise when I pull the tape off you will see the difference. Now that I've painted my vertical stripes I can peel off the tape. my vertical bands enough time to dry and I can now attach the paint to do my horizontal bands. So same thing as before, I'm just going to eyeball this and hopefully I can get it to go in a straight line. Okay, so for the horizontal bands, I've mixed my two colors together just in an effort to use up all the paint and I will paint that color on. Making a mess. Then I will wash my hands. Now it's on to the easy part, attaching the letters. These letters are just vinyl adhesive lettering which is available through any sign company. Just look in the yellow pages. You set the letter in place, then burnish it lightly to make sure that it is stuck to the canvas, then peel back the backing. And there you go. Now there's no uh, rules about how to apply these. Really just choose any sort of pattern you want. You can use as many letters as you want. I've decided just to do the entire alphabet from start to finish. Some in capitals, some in lowercase, all of them in just a white vinyl adhesive lettering. This is my favorite. Well, X marks the spot and I am done. All I need to do is hang this up in our nursery. 
If you're wondering what might be the perfect gift to welcome a Chinese baby, well, we've got just the thing. Giving a bracelet or pendant made of jade is the traditional way to bestow warm wishes upon the new arrival. This beautiful green stone symbolizes love and virtue, as well as power and protection. The ancient Chinese also believed that jade represented the essence of heaven and earth and mankind's cherished connection to both. The bracelet is wrapped and tied in red, which is a symbol of good luck. Now when we return, the nursery is ready for its tiny inhabitant. If you've always thought that a neutral nursery couldn't be warm and welcoming, I hope I've proved you wrong. I've just put the finishing touches on this room, which is a good thing because baby Stephanie arrived a couple of weeks early. So she's been waiting to move into a room until everything was perfect. Oh, I just, I just love everything. Everything just sort of come together. And what do you think Stephanie likes most about this room? The comfy bed. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, the crib is nestled along the back wall here. There's been room for the change table, all the necessary pieces, including the glider. In fact, this small room has turned out to have a terrific layout. It will be really efficient, and there's even room for her to play on the floor as she gets a little bit older. As far as the bed goes, I've dressed it in a palette of five different fabrics, all of them tone-on-tone -tone variations on one another. I've used a ticking stripe in cream and tan, a small gingham seersucker check, a small picnic check, and also we have a larger check that is on the glider and even one little adorable fabric as an accent. Just to bring in a bit of color, we've used this fabric that has sort of rabbit theme to it. So we've got a number of different fabrics all playing on each other, and we've done pillows, we've done the glider, and I've even made this blanket. This is just made using a single bath towel, just a regular size bath towel. It's backed in the seersucker check and it's piped in the leftover picnic check. And as you can see, this will be a wonderful, cozy thing to wrap Stephanie up in when she comes out of the bath. It's laying here right now on top of the change table. As you can see, we had a topper made for the change table that holds the pad and also has some extra storage cubbies on this end. It was made for us by the people that we bought this piece of furniture from. As you can see, the stain is done to match this piece of furniture. And as baby grows up, eventually, this piece can be lifted off. Maybe it can be turned into a storage bin for toys and, uh, arts and crafts supplies and slid under the bed, then the dresser will still remain intact. So this was definitely a terrific find in this room. In order to complement this piece of furniture, we also chose a side table to go by the glider that has a textured top and in a similar finish. So all of these dark wood tones may not have been your first thought for a baby's nursery, but it gives it a grounding and it works well with the contemporary flavor that's throughout the rest of the house. Blends right in. There's no shock when you walk into the room from the other parts of the house. It's beautiful. Well, when all is said and done, I think we've made a wonderful place for Stephanie to start her life. It's warm and welcoming and cozy. I'm Sarah Richardson, and I hope you'll join me next time on Room Service. Welcome to Room Service, I'm Sarah Richardson. Imagine an office dressed in shades of afternoon sunshine. We're taking this oak paneled office from drab to delightful with the addition of French inspired accents, time worn chairs that are given new appeal, and a simple wastebasket with the Midas touch. All this makes our executive retreat the most inviting room in the house, and it's only on room service.
Houses built at the beginning of the 20th century show an incredible attention to detail. This particular house is no exception. I'm standing in a small paneled office that is just off the main hallway. It has oak floors and oak paneling, bookshelves, and fireplace surround. All the features that most executives could only dream about. This particular office belongs to the lady of the house. So we're going to give it a bit more of a feminine touch. We're going to try and lighten up all of this dark wood with some softer fabrics in creams and yellows both on the window blind and also to create a seating area and I'm thinking again keeping in those soft yellows. I need to introduce a new desk into the space. Right now there's a small roll top desk on the far wall but the problem is it looks directly into the wall as opposed to out onto the west facing front garden. So I think the thing to do here is to reorient the desk under this window. It'll just sort of float and allow our lady of the house to take a meeting with somebody else sitting across the desk. That would definitely be an improvement on this space and help to open it up. The bookshelves that are in behind are ideal for storage of desk accessories. We'll just need to reconfigure those a little bit, maybe introduce some family photographs on these back shelves and a filing system here since if we're looking to bring in pieces of furniture that work with the period of the room we're probably going to be looking at something that's an antique I'm thinking it'll likely be in oak we may go a little bit lighter than the paneling but we need to keep the woods consistent I'd also like to see some seating which will put where the roll top desk used to be a lighter carpet but mainly we're gonna brighten it up we're gonna make this pretty and French and feminine Say goodbye to dark and masculine. We're going for light in our office overhaul with hints from the garden, starting with the soft glow of afternoon sun on frilly daffodils in hues of rich yellows. Next, we're infusing the space with all the comfort and warmth of afternoon tea. Steaming hot and served with a touch of lemon, it's pampering and tranquility for one. When all is done, our executive retreat will be infused with light, creamy tones and topped with the zing of lemon. Lemon Fresh. I've started my preliminary search for pieces to use in our office. Now you'll remember we have a lot of great features to work with in the room. We have paneling, oak paneling surrounding all of the walls. What we need is a desk. We need a storage piece. We have a pair of chairs that we'll be reconditioning, but we're going to need something to go in between them. Here's a table here. This is a nice American piece. It's made of solid cherry from the early part of the 19th century. So in a small office, Choosing a table that has a drawer in it is always a good idea. It would offer a little bit of extra storage. So there's a first possibility. There's, I see a grouping of desks here, which offer a number of different solutions. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that I want to have that desk coming out from underneath the window. Here's a desk in oak. This is uh, probably uh, late 19th century, and I love the color of it. I think that this might be a little bit on the masculine side for this office, and perhaps just a little larger than I'm looking for. A five-foot desk would be ideal. And this, oh, apparently this spent a lot of time in a church, as I can see the stamping all over the inside of this drawer. The, the drawers slide well, the desk is made of solid wood, so that's something else to keep in mind when you're out looking for pieces for an office, is what sort of condition they're in. Better to find things that are in relatively good condition to start with, instead of incurring a lot of cost to fix them up. What else do we have to choose from? Well, here's another bookshelf here that might work for us. Now, we do have, as I said, shelves, lots of shelves in the space. This is, this looks like it's walnut actually instead of oak. You can tell because it doesn't have as, you know, the grain isn't as visible as it is in the oak. And this would go with the sort of French provincial style that we have going throughout the rest of the home. So this might be a possibility. Now another thing I need to think about is lighting. So let me see what I can find there as something that will sort of brighten up the space a little bit. This is a brass and crystal fixture here, it's sort of classic French style. It's beautiful, it has plenty of crystals, all of them faceted. There, it's, there's no mistake about it, it's a stunning fixture. The only thing is the size is a little bit large for the office. We have a relatively small room and we don't want to make it seem like we're trying to be too grand. So this is definitely better suited for a small dining room, I'd say. 
whereas something like this with only four arms and no crystals may be better suited for our office. You can see it has a, a lily motif and a little bit of gelding with the four arms it will allow us to put in chandelier bulbs, we'll get a bit of sparkle, it'll still be pretty, it will be romantic, but it won't be overpowering. I found a collection of pieces that all are possibilities for the office. Now it's just a matter of testing and trying to see what will make the perfect mix. As you can see, change is underway in our small executive retreat. I've reconfigured the furniture placement in this room and introduced a whole bunch of new pieces, which I had a lot of fun shopping for. I'm sitting here on this desk, which is done in the French style. It's probably from the 1920s or 30s, and it is in oak. We've had some repairs done to the veneer on the top, a little bit of reconditioning just to make it gleam. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you about putting a desk like this underneath the window is you'll want to make sure you choose something that is finished on both sides. The drawers are on the face side of this desk but it has a finished panel all across what would actually be the back side so that you could pull up another chair and there's knee space here so that you could actually have two people sitting across from each other. This is definitely a good feature of this desk. I found this lamp which is a bridge lamp and it has a really pretty carved detail on the top of it. It just needs a shade and then it can go on the other side of the room in between two chairs which I am going to have reconditioned and reupholstered. Speaking of fabrics and things that are oriented towards upholstery, you'll notice the Roman blind has been installed in the window. And this really was the departure point for the entire room. Starting with a fabric and building up can really create a beautiful feeling in the room. The floral design is lighthearted, whimsical, but it's also fresh and springy at the same time. And I love that sort of mustard tone. So we'll be using that throughout the entire room. We've brought in our shelf unit that I found when I was out sourcing decided on this again a little bit of reconditioning to touch up the stain I've got a collection of baskets here which will try out and figure out what works for storage both in these shelves and on all of the open bookshelves on the other side of the room now there, in addition to the basket storage, you also need to think about filing storage. And there wasn't enough in this office before. So we've found two oak filing cabinets. These are actually reproduction filing cabinets, which is something you might want to keep in mind. If you're looking for old cabinets, you'll find that they don't have the slides that support a hanging folder. So the advantage to these is that all your files will be held neatly in place. Plus, the color of the oak doesn't stand out against these walls. Well, we've made some good progress. It's all from this point on about finishing touches, about creating some seating, introducing a carpet, and all of the artwork. The right light fixture sets the mood and establishes the feeling of the room. In this space, it's very important because it's also seen off the hallway. So obviously, I wanted to make sure that I chose just the right fixture. I'm thinking that I want something that is a dropped fixture, and I did see one when I was out shopping. but. I wanted to see whether there was other options that I might be able to consider. This is a tip that you might want to try. Ask the shop owner if you can bring the fixture home and try it on approval. That way you can set it in the space and see how it looks overall. Now I knew I didn't want something with crystals and wanted something quite simple, so I've amassed a collection of five fixtures and now it's just a matter of testing each one out to see which one works best. The right seating for our client's office was an easy challenge. She already had two chairs with sentimental appeal. The only problem is they didn't fit with the design of the space. So we paid a visit to Pablo Garcia, who specializes in reconditioning treasured pieces to give them a fresh new appeal. Here's his plan. What we have to work with right now is late 50s, probably early 60s uh, chair. Essentially what we are going to do is these uh, square arms We'll try to uh, bring them a bit more up to date, make a more tra traditional piece. We'll have them uh, rounded. We'll probably add a skirt to hide the legs. With the back, what we'll uh, end up doing, because now the, the arm will be uh, rounded, is we'll, um, we'll just make it go together with the arm and sort of have the back just rounded to the chair. 
There are a few key characteristics to look at when deciding whether it's worth having a piece reconditioned. Generally, the older the piece, the better the craftsmanship. The hardwood frames and inner workings were built to last. A good piece of furniture would have coil springs, uh, which you can tell by just sort of rubbing it on the bottom. You'll feel the webbing. And a lot of pieces will have coil even in the back, like, like this one here. A few things that tell you that it's been well constructed. There's always uh, things to consider as, as how far you want to go with reshaping arms or back or, or the overall frame. Obviously, the, the, the structure itself, there's not much you can do to that. You can work with an arm that's slightly, slightly bigger, depending on what the frame will allow. Obviously, other things to consider is the seating space that you will have if you go with your arm just too, uh, too large. And the uh, same goes with the back. If you want to alter it just too much, if you wanted to turn it into a loose cushion, you have to consider depth. If your existing furniture is ripe for a makeover, then reupholstery just might offer a practical and economical solution, allowing you to integrate a sentimental piece of furniture with enduring quality into your new scheme. Once we're done with this piece, you'll realize that what used to be a dated piece will turn into a, a timeless piece, a traditional piece, uh, definitely worth, uh, worth recovering. We'll leave Pablo to continue the transformation of our chairs and we'll be sitting pretty in no time. You may not think that my idea of a great project is the same as yours, but you may also not have ever gone shopping and tried to find a really attractive garbage can. I know that sounds so average, but they're tough to find, and if you do find them, they usually cost an absolute mint. So I decided to come up with my own solution of how to create an inexpensive yet elegant garbage can for our office. I started out by finding this very simple plywood garbage can. Now you could also use this as recycling since we don't normally create too much garbage in our office anymore since it's all for paper. So I thought this was an ideal size and able to hold a lot of paper. The first thing I did was I got just a sanding block and lightly sanded all of the edges down just to make sure it's really nice and smooth. Next thing is to prime the entire surface. I would suggest priming inside and out because you want it all to look the same when you're done. You want it to be really sharp looking. So I'm using a super adherent latex primer. You could use an oil-based primer too, but if you want to be able to do this all in an afternoon, why not go for the latex? Start out just by painting the entire surface. Now that that's primed, you can set that aside and let that dry. The next thing I did was I used a soft sort of creamy yellow paint. Now you'll remember that my concept for this room is all about soft yellows and sort of a golden glow. So I just did uh, use some leftover latex paint and coated this entire can inside and out with a couple coats of the latex. Next thing I want to do is I want to add some decorative accent bands to this. So I'm going to start, I'm using a low tack painter's masking tape, which comes in handy for just about every project you can imagine. And I want to work with the sloped angles on the sides here and create a banded pattern. Next step is to apply the sizing. Uh, sizing for gold leaf comes in a jar like this and it, a little bit goes a very long way. It looks basically like thinned down white glue. It takes about 20 minutes for it to dry and it will stay tacky so that you can use it for 24 hours. Just paint a bit on the, the bands of tape. While that dries, I'm going to paint the stripes in between. And this is the color I'm using. And I started out by using the same color that I used for my garbage can, and I just added a hint of some leftover orange paint that I had. And as you can see, it's just warmed it up a little bit. Having some fun now. Yeah. 
is the sound of tacky gold leaf sizing, which means it's ready to go. It's been about 15 minutes and it's dried and it's sticky. So just to show you, gold leaf comes in packages of 25 sheets and they're about five by five inches square. And as you can see, there's the sheet. They're incredibly light. And I didn't want to waste any gold leaf. So what I did was I just used a pair of scissors and I cut the package of leaf into long, narrow strips. So now I can just, where'd it go? There it is. I can just apply the leaf on the areas where I've applied the sizing. It's very light. I never do this the proper way. There's all these expensive tools you can use. But you can also just use your fingers. Just try not to handle it too much because it will tarnish if you do. So I've got the last of my bits of leaf on. And before I remove the tape, I'm just gonna use a soft cloth to gently burnish the leaf. Now that's all done. I just have to pull off my pieces of tape. Once you've finished burnishing off all those loose bits of gold leaf, I would suggest using a water-based polyurethane and painting a couple of coats both on the outside and on the inside just to make sure that it's protected. And when you're finished, you'll have a wastebasket for the office that is simple, it's elegant, and it's useful. Fine personal stationery speaks volumes. Paper with a high cotton content is a delight to touch and to write on. Solid white or ivory paper with black lettering is the traditional choice, while blue lettering is considered more casual. Monograms and graphic images incorporate a personal touch. The font you choose can convey a classic elegance or make a playful statement, and using engraved type makes a great impression with visual and tactile appeal. All part of expressing yourself beyond words. In a pretty hectic household with four kids, this paneled office has become an oasis of calm. And let's face it, it's been given a feminine treatment because I don't think originally that this office belonged to the lady of the house. So we've given this a bit of a modern twist. Now that's not to say that our interpretation of this room is modern, but we've created a sun-filled, soft, French-inspired space that is really enchanting and inviting no matter what the time of day. It's a fairly monochromatic look I've gone for. I wanted it all to feel like soft shades of gold and really just like sunshine, and that's how I feel now when I'm in it. The combination of the fabric on the Roman blind, on this side chair here, and then on our chairs that have been reupholstered and reworked. And as you can see, they look magnificent. They're now really inviting. It makes you just wanna come and have an after-dinner conversation or spend some time with a good book. We've chosen a really soft chenille. It's almost got a two-tone gold color to it as a background and then I've accented it with some silk taffeta pillows because you have to have a little bit of elegance always and this is a great place to introduce it. It's a two inch check which keeps it from being fussy and that was really key in this room because it could definitely become over the top elegant and seem off-putting but we wanted this to still feel approachable and inviting always. We've added a brush fringe trim which just gives it a little bit more texture and interest. Lighting is key in this room. We have a desk lamp which creates an amber glow throughout the room. Our choice of chandelier, well, this was my favorite and I'm delighted to see it installed. We decided to go with the Italian gilded chandelier that adds just a bit of sparkle and of course we put it on a dimmer so that it can be adjusted throughout the day and evening. We also brought in a bridge lamp here and as you can see it has an antique parchment shade on it which means that it's had a coating placed over the top, just gives it more of a soft light and it casts a downward glow perfect for reading. Side tables are important just to make sure that there's a place to set down that cup of tea and this ends up being the perfect vantage point to sit back and admire our gallery wall. Now this isn't your average gallery wall. We decided to create a wall of family photographs. We printed them all up to be exactly the same size which is 8 by 8 inches square. I chose a really classic frame profile and it's sort of a ribbed gilded frame but that's not too shiny with just a small rope detail on it. Then I wanted to make them look 
ultra crisp and really set off against the frame. So I chose a 12 ply mat. I've hung them in two groupings, one of four and one of eight. So all members of the family, including the very important family dog, are represented on this wall. Now with the carpet installed, it helps brighten it up, keeps things light, it makes it feel sun washed all day long, and we've created an environment that is feminine yet casually elegant at the same time. I'm Sarah Richardson and I hope you'll join me next time on Room Service. Welcome to Room Service, I'm Sarah Richardson. Are you trying to satisfy your appetite for color? A typical living dining space is our blank canvas for a multicultural mix of eye-popping shades and textures. With inspiration coming from exotic fabrics, we'll also tap into the art of designing woven rugs and, as a finishing touch, celebrate the simple beauty of orchids. We're creating our very own jewel tone salon, and it's only on room service. designer's dream, so I'm definitely in heaven. The house was built about a year ago for our clients, a young family, and it has wide open spaces and lots of natural light. One of the most exciting things about this room is our clients welcome the use of color. We'd like to, you know, entertain in there when we can, and we wanted to get some color in there too, because well, the house is pretty neutral and we wanted to have some color and we thought that was a good spot for it. We're thinking reds and purple and some really uh, luxurious textures. One of the things to keep in mind is that they already have a family room for lounging and just hanging out at the back of the house. So creating a multi-purpose space isn't really the focal point here. The only thing we have to keep in mind is that there are no doors to close off. So this still has to be family friendly as kids will be coming through on a regular basis. Now, what I'm thinking about as far as furniture placement goes is keeping the lines on the furniture clean and tailored. We've got French provincial furniture mixed with contemporary in the dining room and I really like the way that's all coming together. The dining room table may prove to be a little bit on the small side so we'll have to deal with that. A rug would warm it up and definitely some drapes. As far as the living room goes I'm thinking a pair of chairs to go in between the dining room and the living room so that you can still walk in between and you have enough room to move around. I don't mind if it's two separate rooms, but I'd like them to complement each other and to come in and you see the whole area together as opposed to being really choppy. Then I'd like to see a tall, high-backed sofa, something that's sort of uh, 30s inspired that will sit in front of the window. We've got room on either side of this fireplace to do console tables and then dramatic artwork and some really interesting light fixtures. We're going to go for furniture that is elegant, maybe a little bit deco, definitely French, and we're going to create a sumptuous, exciting and enticing living room. Saturated color is bright and bold and happening all around us, and it's waiting to make a splash on an otherwise bland interior. Think mango, cassis, and raspberry, exotic fruits of fancy that inspire our appetite for fun. And when it comes to the regal range of purples, what could be better than the classic aubergine to complement our berry tones? Imagine a room dressed in delightful shades as fanciful and fun as a jeweled brooch, and you'll see our vision for living in style. Our living room dining room is big and open and it's begging for color. Our clients told me that I can use color as strong as I like. So I decided to come down to Little India in search of inspiration and what I see around me is yards and yards of saturated color. There are saris. These are art silk saris. They're actually not silk. They are uh, an artificial polyester silk and each one of these has seven yards on it and they range 
version price from about $25 up. So when you break that down as a per yard price, it becomes very reasonable. I'm thinking maybe I could use some, look at this red, something like this with the gold threads. They even have an accented band at the top and this is designed to go up and over your shoulder. So you could cut them up and use them in different ways for different purposes. You could use it as a tablecloth. It could be turned into long flowing drapes with really intense color that would be so dramatic maybe a little too much for us but I'm thinking about using something for pillows and just other accents through the room so what have we got here Look at this one. This is purples and blues, and it's sort of iridescent and shimmering. There's some gold threads woven through it. And then even again, these hits of rusty red, which I want to see used somewhere in the room. I think I might have to check this one out. It's interesting now that they're not silk. Now there are some, there's silk that's sold by the yard. That's only in solid colors, and it's quite lightweight and filmy. And there's even some real silk ones over here. All of these are real silk? Yeah. This is and is this the type of thing that you'd um, use for, would you wear this for every day or would this just be no, something? No, this is for like a special occasion, like for wedding parties and things like that. And what about the beaded ones? When would you wear those? And again, special occasion? Uh, well, yeah, it depends. If it is a very heavy sari, then it's for wedding or parties. And okay. sometimes we wear like evening wear. Right. Yeah. So would this be, I found this one and I love yeah. these colors. What would, th would this be, this would be sort of more evening yeah more evening and it's, it's casual it's not like something special okay yeah but the colors are terrific yeah. I love <laughs> now these are all the greens and the oranges is this sort of traditional colors for the more uh, well ones? yes some of the like in communities they wear this color in wedding oh I and, see and there is a in our wedding there is a henna ceremony okay so they wear this color this color green the color, orange and the green color, during yeah. the henna ceremony yeah. okay and what about this I think this one this is just... wedding sari this is wedding sari so this is something this would be worn by the bride yes oh it's beautiful this is a wedding sari look at that a little rich for my budget today. I think I'll stick with this one. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, I'm very enamored with this fabric. It is so glamorous, and I think it's going to be a really exotic accent in this room. And I think exotic is going to have to be the sort of key word for this. It's going to be exotic. It's going to be eclectic, especially the way it's coming together. And I'd have to say it's a good thing that our clients trust us because this combination of elements that we have in this room right now may look a little bit odd to you. We have French in the dining room, French chandelier and French table. We've brought in two Tibetan rugs, uh, different choices here. One in the living room has a softer palette. It's definitely graphic still, but not quite as playful and bold as the one in the dining room. The one thing that both of these carpets add is a lot of softness to the room, which is terrific because it is such a big space. We've brought in a pair of tables on either side side. Now I had these custom made and they're 36 inches wide and they're 30 inches tall and they're made of an antique brass. We've chosen lights that complement them and these are made of resin and they're just a chunky square base in a sort of vanilla color that accents the wall and when you see this room you start seeing the play of the carpet, the wall color, the lights and the drapes all together. The drapes are spectacular. I just love the color. We chose to go with a tone on tone stripe in a Dupioni silk, again in the sort of Dijon shades with a hint more gold. So we're really going with some graphic elements. We're also mixing different eras. We've got a really modern contemporary table here and then I found a pair of cocktail tables and these are sort of deco era and they also have a brass base on them and then they have a marble top. I'm not sure whether we'll keep the tables in the end with this marble or whether we might replace it with a wooden top instead. We'll have to figure that out. We've got uh, a bench that's come in here. You, I said that I wanted to go with bold color so here's the purple that picks up this color in the sari and I've got some pillows here in a really rich gold color. So we're going for color. We're not through with our color yet, and we're certainly not through with our experimentation of mixing eras and styles for dramatic effect. Placing a mirror of 
above the fireplace over the mantel has always been a popular choice as a decorating treatment. But here's something you might want to consider if you're thinking about doing it in your home. Check the height of the mantel and see what the reflection is in the mirror before you go ahead and purchase it. You might want to bring in a mirror from another area of the house. And here's why. Sometimes you get a beautiful vista. It brings in a view of the outdoors. Other times you end up strictly seeing the ceiling and the molding, which is less than ideal in my opinion. So here's something you might want to consider instead. For this space, we've decided to go with a vertical mirror on either side of the mantel instead of going above the mantel. As you can see, this opens it up, shows us a reflected view of the dining room instead of just seeing the top of our head. The search for artwork need not be limited to what hangs on your walls. Brothers Alan and Michael Pluvacchio strive to create modern masterpieces that are soft underfoot. We met with Alan to find out about some of his latest designs. Uh, when we design a rug, uh, we have the lifestyle in mind. And that meaning what type of room that could be, whether it be a living room, dining room, or less formal and more casual of the family room. And I'll keep the elements that is important in each room. For instance, if it's a living room rug, uh, the scale should be a bit bigger and a bit more relaxed versus a dining room carpet, which we could get away with more design and colors. If the customer is looking for a rug, one of the very first things that we we'll ask them is the type and the color of the floor. And that's something that a lot of people overlook. Because floor acts as a background to the rug, so imagine uh, framing your art. So we have to really pay attention or know what type of floor do you have. Where I get my inspiration is mostly from fashion, because uh, fashion is about new things. Something that uh, people wanted to change, they, uh, they look at fashion magazines, fabrics and colors. And those are the stuff that I keep watching or having an eye for. Alan looks at rugs as works of art, quite often the largest piece of art in a room. For this reason, each sketch is manipulated to ensure balance in both color and design. I designed the rug on an 8x10 scale because that's a good enough of the design that it not only shows well, but it's the most practical size for every room. Before the carpet gets made, we'll go through a few processes of uh, narrowing the colors down, uh, which is the most important part of each room, is the color. And therefore, in our business, color is the foundation. From then on, we try to put those colors into the right uh, place in the rug. And we do a few tries, we go back, sometimes it takes us a few days to go back and forth to see whether the carpet is getting too heavy on one side or it's getting too light in the center. And uh, one of the other key things in the designing and uh, coloring the rug is having the harmony and having a balance and having a flow of colors. And uh, sometimes I start from the center out. And uh, once you look back, your eyes should not go to any specific part of the rug. You should, we would be able to look at the whole rug as the way you look in a painting and uh, just try to capture something that it hasn't been done before. I wanted to add another exotic touch to our living room. So I've decided to put together an orchid centerpiece. Now this is the type of thing that you could put on the center of a dining table or you can put it on a table in the living room. The wonderful thing about orchids is although they may be a little bit on the pricey side, the advantage is they'll last up to three months and they are so easy to care for. So what I'm gonna do is I'm starting with some pebbled orchid bark, which is dried, sterilized, buffed fir bark. That's a tongue twister. And I'm just gonna put it into the bottom of my planter. This is to promote good drainage for the orchids. 
so I'll put a couple of packages in this. Now the advantage about orchids is they used to be quite exotic, but now they are available at almost all grocery stores and local flower shops. So they're available year round. You will notice a slight fluctuation in the price of them throughout the year. So I always try and buy them when the price goes down. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start, I'm gonna use a variation of the pink, and these are the Phalaenopsis orchids. I think that's how you pronounce it. And this is called the Happy Smile. And I'm just gonna put, drop it out of its pot. And you can see that all the roots sort of come loose and it's in a mixture of styrofoam and these bark chips. So it's a really loose mixture. I'm hoping this is gonna stay upright. You wanna keep it with the wires and uh, we want the leaves to sort of float out over the top of this planter. I was inspired to do this because I took a trip to Hawaii and there are orchids absolutely everywhere and especially uh, done in really stunning planters like this. One alone is a beautiful addition to any room, but four is going to be absolutely magnificent. The key to orchids is keeping them away from too much direct light and also not watering them very often. The reason I love them is because I've killed many indoor plants in my life, but I don't seem to be able to wreck an orchid. If you water them about once a week and don't overwater them, they will last for three, three and a half months. Once all the blooms are done, you can cut them back and they will bloom again. And then I'm gonna fill in with some more of the bark. A little bit more bark. I'm glad I bought a lot of this bark. Now, you'd need a lot less bark if you didn't use such a deep planter. I've chosen to go with this planter because I want it to have a really full look in the room. Now that I've got all my plants in place and covered with the bark, I'm going to add a bit of decorative moss. Now this is called sheet moss. You can also get Spanish moss, which is the more wiry stuff. And I'm just going to tuck it in and around for a sort of more lush look. If you want it to be a bit more rustic looking, you can keep the, just leave it at the bark stage, or you can choose to add the moss. My moss is all twisted around. One last piece, I'm just gonna tuck under here. Dust off these leaves. And there you go. A magnificent, exotic, and colorful centerpiece. A terrific addition to the living room. The technique of making lacquerware has hardly changed since it was invented around 400 BC. Up to 40 coats of lac tree resin are applied to a surface which is rubbed with pumice between each coating. This creates a tough surface with a lustrous finish, ideal for lacquer's original use as a protective coating on wood and leather. Over the years, this decorative art has been applied to various surfaces or embellished with pictorial motifs in mother of pearl or gold. Lacquerware pieces are delicately detailed treasures that are functional, strong, and very enduring. If you think my use of color in this room is surprising, well, that makes two of us. I have to admit, I'm a little bit shocked at how many bold colors I've used in this room and on what scale I've used them. Now, it's not really in my nature to use this much color in a room. However, our clients are young and fun and they love color. So, naturally, we had to design the room that would work best for them. So what we've decided to do is to use intense hits of color in certain spots and then keep the rest of the palette quite subdued. 
Here's what I mean. As far as the sofa goes, I decided to use this incredible tomato red. I found this fabric and I just couldn't resist. This is a custom sofa that I designed and it's sort of a modern take on a more traditional piece. I like to think of it as being sort of like a really updated wing chair in some ways. It's not very deep and it only has one single seat cushion, but it's still incredibly comfortable because we've put our intense regal purple velvet diamond tufted bench right in front of it so you can sit down and you can rest your feet on this bench and it makes it feel much deeper. I love the the red and the purple together. I just, I love that. It, that's the first thing I see when I come in and it really, is, it stands out and I just love the way that looks together. As far as accessories go on the sofa, I decided to go with a couple of different fabrics. For lumbar support, I've used these long cushions and they're 15 by 22 inches and they're covered in a fabric which makes me think of Coco Chanel. It's a diamond quilted silk in a really intense, almost like a goldenrod color. Then, of course, here's my sari fabric that I bought when I was out shopping in Little India and I love the way it sets off this bench and even the carpet and all of the accessories throughout the room. It's a real eye-popping hit when you first walk in. Now on the other side of the room we introduced two other chairs and these sort of act as a divider between the living room and the dining room. They're a slightly smaller scale but they're still incredibly comfortable because they have a rounded back. We sort of took an indicator from the French country pieces that we already had in the dining room but we didn't want this space to end up feeling fussy so we went with cleaner lines such as the vintage art deco tulip table which is in walnut which goes in between these two chairs and also a pair of vintage occasional chairs and these are great because they provide extra seating we had them reupholstered in a creamy yellow ultra suede and added a couple of little brass tacks just around the top of the leg as an accent as you can see now, the tables, the little cocktail tables that we had before, which had marble tops, I've removed the marble and gone just with a black lacquer finish on the top. And we decided that they were great when used as nesting tables underneath these more modern console tables that flank either side of the fireplace. You can see that our mirrors are hung, our lamps are dressed, they create beautiful reflections and help to open up the room. They also give a little bit of extra sparkle and they don't compete with the piece of artwork that we've introduced above the mantel. As for the dining room, just a few simple touches were needed to finish it off. So we've got our playful, colorful, square patterned carpet. I've used a last bit of the sari fabric to make a table runner and we've introduced some artwork on the wall and some accessories all in our shades of red and intense sort of amethyst and gold. The color scheme is great. I mean, we wanted some color, and we've got we've got color, but it's it's subtle too, which is what we were looking for. But it's uh, it's really warm too, and we're really happy with it. And the best part about this house is it's fun, it's playful, and it's sophisticated at the same time. I'm Sarah Richardson, and I hope you'll join me next time on Room Service. Welcome to Room Service. I'm Sarah Richardson. Does your home office still work when it's time to play? We'll create an office lounge that does double duty, giving it a warm and masculine touch. With some unique vintage office accessories, a hand from the client to give the fireplace the once over, nice, and a visit to a blacksmith who gives iron accessories the custom touch. We're making it fun when the working day's done, and it's only on room service. modern families. Many people create a family room that's adjoined to the kitchen and then the original living room becomes redundant. That's exactly what's happened in this house. They've done an extensive renovation, created an amazing family room, and now no one uses the living room. However, this living room is connected to the home office. And interestingly, this home office used to be the entrance to the house. And I think it has created an incredible workspace. It gets both south and east light, which is ideal. And it's located on the main floor. What we'd like to do is get the office up and running properly and the living room is sort of like sitting there and never gets used. It's just not, it's more of a storage area for furniture than anything else. 
One of the eyesores of this living room for me, I have to say, I'm going to confess, is this fireplace. Um, I just find it's quite outdated looking. Everything else has been brought up to date and modernized, but this has been left. So we need to address this mantle and paint this, maybe add some tile, redo the hearth. I'm sure that with little expense, but a little bit of effort, we can turn this around and really make it a feature. In the living room, there's some uh, tables my uncle made. Uh, there's a walnut burl table I'd like to keep, and basically everything else can go. Another thing I'd like to think about here is not making it another place with just another sofa, but creating a space that's really a terrific area to sit down and have a conversation, whether it's having a meeting with clients, since it's right beside the office, or sort of while entertaining guests. I think four chairs would be a terrific setup in this room. Bring them in a little bit closer, forget the old sofa with the bad slip cover, forget the old wing chairs, replace this with some new elements that will really make it feel far more inviting. I'm thinking of going with a fairly masculine palette in here. We've got sort of olivey greens on the walls and more subdued colors throughout the house. So we can definitely handle kind of darker, richer tones here and bring them into the office. Right now it's just a functional office, but I want it to be comfortable to sit in. I want it just to look uncluttered because right now it's a disaster zone. As far as the office goes, built-in is the key when it's this small a space. So a large desk surface here, maybe a new pendant light, something that will create a little bit of mood in this room, and more storage here built in under the window and on either side of the radiator. I'm thinking of going with a fairly dark wood tone. We want this to feel somewhat masculine, but yet contemporary and sleek at the same time. If the office is designed for the man in the house and sleek is the style you're after, then prepare to get dressed for business. We want our office lounge to look as polished and professional as an elegant silk tie. We're designing the space to be a calm and soothing environment to blend seamlessly with existing elements and create a rich backdrop for both work and play. Our color palette takes a nod from the first cup of the day, dressed in shades of coffee, mocha, and cafe au lait to make it warm and comforting day or night. My gentleman's office is underway. I've ordered a desk and some seating, but what I really wanted to do was to make this feel sort of more like a vintage office. I don't know what you want your office to be like. Some people want them crisp and contemporary. Others want a more tactile feel, something a bit more old-fashioned and rustic. This building has actually been around since 1852, and the shop's been here since sort of the mid-60s, specializing in vintage office furniture. It's literally stacked to the ceiling, and it's a treasure trove. So come on in and let me show you what they've got. If the idea of reconditioning vintage pieces makes you feel a little bit queasy, then you can check out this side of the store, which is filled with reproduction and new pieces. However, I think that the old pieces are far more interesting. After all, you don't see a cabinet like this filled with vintage desk accessories every day. We've got pen holders on an onyx slab, original ink wells. These add just that little extra touch to an office. What else do they have? Oh, this is... Very cool. This is an old step-on garbage can in wood. I've never seen anything like this. Apparently it came from a doctor's office. And I think that that, again, just so rich. Incorporating a number of these different woods into the office, you can still mix them with some newer elements as well. Like, I think this lamp, is. this is a keeper for us. I love this. It's got, it's made of, I think this is made of walnut. And you can see it's got the original wide socket base. So you can either, you can still find sometimes the wide socket light bulbs or there's an adapter that you can get from a lighting store and then you can use just a regular size light bulb. But that's something that I want to point out because if you're looking for vintage lighting, you'll often find that wide base. Look at these great, these are old um, card files from a library. This has original brass hardware and they're priced at about $10 per drawer. So you can get one of these big units 
units. You could use it to store arts and crafts supplies, pens and pencils. And it even has these two little pull-out trays so you can keep everything organized. I think they make great side tables and just a really interesting piece. It adds texture to that office environment. You can also use things like an old fan. This one has a brass blade. You just want to keep your fingers out of it when it's turned on. Or these oak letter trays. These are a terrific addition to the office. You can stack them up, get them in different woods, different sizes. You can use these as your in and out trays. You can use them as stationary trays. And they look so much nicer than what you can find today. Well, what you can find when you're in here is a vast collection of things that help to add that certain element of a nod to the past into your home office. Okay, we're doing something a little bit unusual here today. Instead of having the client sit back and watch the process, instead I've got the client doing the project. This is great. So, George, what are you doing there? I'm making a mess of things, Sarah. Great. Okay. <laughs> what we're doing is the fireplace that is here now and as original was pretty ugly and we wanted to come up with an inexpensive solution to change the entire appearance of this fireplace. So we started out by removing the supports that were on the mantle and then we are going to add a new cap on top of this because this is actually tied in through the original plaster and it's also behind the drywall so this mantle had to stay. We're going to cap it with a new one. George did a very good job of painting all of the brick. And how much paint did this use? Oh, uh, three quarters of a gallon. So this stuff really soaks it up, something you're gonna wanna keep in mind if you have brick and you wanna paint it. And we just used a latex paint to paint this. Now what we're doing is we are going to use these mosaics. These are really beautiful tumbled marble mosaic. And we're gonna do it on this front piece here. And then we've got another stone. This is called a cobblestone marble. We went with a 16 by 24 inch tile. The real advantage to using a tile like this instead of a solid slab is, let's be honest, it's the budget. Um, doing a hearth, a solid piece of hearth usually costs about $400 and these tiles were about $25 each and we only needed five tiles. So as far as budget goes, we're stretching it. We're doing a good job here. And now, you've also cut those, and are we ready to put those in place? Yeah. Okay, great. Some of these are going to fall off because they just... They're you know, going to pop out? Yeah, okay. Just, we have to glue them back I'm going to... Nice. I've never tiled before, George. Do I have to, um... No, I just have to press it in, move it around, let the mortar okay. sink into everything, and then we let it dry. And then, and then what? And we grout and then, it? Yeah. There's another yeah. one? Okay, no, that's, it. it's the little black piece. It's this little guy. Nope, not that guy. It's like making a puzzle. <laughs> I can't believe it. Excuse me. I'm not Okay, so do you normally just grow as you go along? Don't normally sessions? do this. <laughs> I thought general contractors are supposed to know all this Apparently, stuff. you're supposed to only glue as to a certain extent and then continue, and then continue again, because otherwise it'll dry up and set up on you. Okay, so how, what's your, what's your working time? Oh, it? about 25 minutes or okay. something like that. All right. Oh, wow, this is looking beautiful. <gasps> George, this is incredible. What's our next step after this dries? We fill it with? Uh, we're going with the natural gray grout. Okay. Uh, wall, a wall mix, um, okay. actually a floor mix to give you a nice sort of a sandy grit to it instead right. of a smooth Because the uh, difference finish. is if you want a smooth finish, you go with a wall grout. Wall, yeah. Otherwise, a floor grout has a sanded Correct. finish to it. That's right. And then these, you cut, you use the water saw to cut these, right? Yes, right. And now, if you don't have one of those, you can, you can rent those, Yes, right? from any rental place. Okay. So these, just to give us yep. an idea, yep. are going to set right in here. All right, we'll bring it flush to the edge here right and then the we'll edge. any bit of grouting we'll do at the end and the color will be very okay. similar so you won't really know. Okay, now when you're doing this, do you normally put a grout line across the front when you're using stone like On this? On an old home like this I wouldn't do it because the hardwood floor is original and it could move and crack okay. your grout line. It looks like uh, it Not doesn't so look good. well at all. Okay, yeah. so it's better to leave this and we'll only grout across the yeah. back. Yeah, about here. a half inch, three eighths, something like that. Okay, can yeah. we set one of those in place sure. just to see how that's going to look? Okay. Okay, so approximately And then how like big that. a grout line? You would leave that big a grout yeah, line? Yeah, okay. I think so. It and kind of matches the... To coincide with the that's brick. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is a fantastic solution for this. So yeah, thanks. It's going to be great. My pleasure. Thanks, Thank Sam. You, you just have to finish it. Yeah.
Picture the days gone by when gentlemen retreated to the library for port and cigars after dinner. Formal jackets were removed and swapped for comfortable, elegant, and rather sensual smoking jackets. Luxurious fabrics such as soft velvets, shimmering oriental silks, and sumptuous brocades in deep, dark colors are classic, and the jackets would often be embellished with silk cording, a crest, or a monogram. Smoking jackets indeed suggest a studied retreat to calm, comfort, and luxury, with just a hint of indulgence. It may have looked a little bit dicey when George and I were working on the fireplace, and I bet you didn't think we knew what we were doing, but it's looking pretty good. We've finished this mosaic section at the top. We've got all of our stone ready to go along the bottom. Now we just have to grout it and wait for this uh, mantle to come in as well. I've turned my attention to some other things, such as the lounge area of this office environment, and I'm going to reveal to you the really exciting part, and that is... Our new chairs, these have just been delivered. We have four leather chairs that have replaced the love seat and two wing chairs that were here before. It's an ideal use of the space. It creates a terrific conversational grouping. Everybody is the perfect distance away from one another. And we were able to incorporate all of these antique tables that George already had. So we have three different woods, which I find interesting. We have a burled walnut here for the oval coffee table. We have a set of really beautiful um, mahogany nesting tables, and then we have this small oak table over here. The great thing is they're all really rich tones, and we're gonna use those to incorporate into all the other elements of this room. We're going to bring in a wood-stained mantle here, and then we've taken a color out of this table that we're gonna use for the office. We wanted something that was stained and really um, rich and more of a masculine feel than something that was a painted finish. So I know you wanna see what does it look like. Well, you can take a look in, but what you can see is it's not here yet because we are waiting for it still to be built. So we have to be patient because these things take time when you're dealing with custom cabinetry it always takes some time but they will be here shortly other things we've done we've brought in a new rug which helps to define this space makes it a bit cozier and also keeps the room from feeling too stuffy so i think that's a great addition i've got accessories here to unpack drapes that are on the way something that's going to go around this radiator here and soften the room this combination of sort of muted greens and rich browns is coming together it's a really masculine environment a place that you want to lounge and hang out. This is a fabulous den for men. Artisans direct their talents to a wide variety of materials. If you think the age-old art of blacksmithing is limited to being heavy and chunky, you may soon realize that graceful lines and delicate curves can be rendered in what is so often considered a utilitarian material. Blacksmithing of steel involves heating the steel and getting it to a desired shape that's in your mind or on a drawing. Uh, since I can't draw, then all the shapes come out of my mind. And that way, nobody can hold me to it. Iron is not a readily available product anymore. It's called mild steel now because they impose carbon in it to make it a usable metal. Iron in its true form is very soft, and that's why in the old days, they did some beautiful, intricate pieces from iron. It was very easy to work with. And now it's, it's at least twice as hard to work with mild steel. We can get iron, but it's very, very cost prohibitive in most applications. So in other words, you use mild steel, you, you have to heat it more, you have to work it more, um, and, and heat it more often. Whereas iron, you could keep it red hot just by striking with a hammer. For Addy, blacksmithing is a family affair. Both his wife and two children are involved in the business. Addy's son and daughter assemble the pieces while his wife translates his thoughts to paper. Together, they create unique custom pieces that blend family spirit with pride of craftsmanship. Your most common concept is that it adds masculinity. And it's not always the case because you can get a very delicate piece. If it's done nice and the scrolls are very nice, it can actually be very feminine or it can enhance the delicate side of a, a lot of rooms. I unfortunately likes to do the, the big meaty heavy stuff uh, and all the frilly stuff I'll call it, you know, for lack of a better word, is uh, I let my daughter do. And so she does a lot of the finer scrolls and the finer forging and I stick to the big heavy medieval stuff. And a lot of people in today's 
society do not understand that you can actually have something made that's for you and, and with you in mind, you know. A lot of places will give you a choice, here's your five choices and you pick from it. And we just don't work that way and it's, better, it's been very successful for us. It's never the same, it's always changing, you know. And it's as unique as the people we meet. When it comes to home offices, beauty and function don't necessarily go hand in hand. What do I mean? Well, I know those dry erase boards are very useful, a great place to jot down memos, reminders, and telephone numbers, but I really wanted George's office to look spectacular. So here's what I came up with instead. I went to my glass store and I had a sheet of quarter inch thick glass sandblasted for me. I've put the shiny side out and then I've used some decorative bolts and nuts to hold the sheet of glass just a couple of inches off from the wall. Now that it's in place, it's a great tool for keeping track of all of those important meetings. And when it's all done, you just wipe it clean. The installation of the office is complete, the dust is settled, the plastic's been removed, and I have to tell you that I am admiring this fireplace. Now that I look at it, I actually think that this bow front piece looks like it was made for this marble mosaic. And you have to admit, we took what was a really ugly fireplace and we made it look a whole lot better for not a lot of money. Probably the biggest difference was the fireplace. Uh, just to paint the brick alone, just sort of really made it. It just blended right into the walls and with the combination of the mosaics and the limestone, uh, it was fabulous. One of the big changes was putting on this new mantle and it is made of cherry and it has a combination sort of walnut cherry stain on it. You'll also notice our iron fireplace tools and accessories from the people that we went to go visit. And another change that we've made in this space is that we took down the Venetian blind that used to be here. We really needed to soften it and unify it overall, both in colors and textures, but also in some of the accessories to make it feel a little bit more loungy and a lot more inviting. So the drapes that I chose to use are it's actually just a polyester fabric in a kind of olivey tone. We've hung them floor to ceiling, and we did a rod that bows out around the radiator so that they're not draping over the rad. So that was a really effective treatment here. You'll notice we are still using George's antique tables that he had. They've blended seamlessly into this room. We've got our lamp that I found when I was out shopping. And again, it has that same warmth and richness because that's really what we want this space to feel like, an inviting spot to come and hang out, either whether it's during the day for meetings or in the evening post-dining. Now, the thing you really want to see, I know, it's the office. And it's here and it is done. So come and check it out. You can see that we use the same wood tone as the mantle for all of our built-ins. And they're done in three sections. First is the desk unit. Now we had to do it with a little bit of a notch in the depth of the desk because we only had about 22 inches just inside the door. And we wanted our desk overall to be 28 inches deep to accommodate the monitor, the keyboard, the phone, everything else that goes along with it. You can see that everywhere we've gone with just a very simple, it's a beveled edge, a beveled nosing on all of the tabletops. And then we've gone with a shaker panel with a brushed steel handle on the drawers. We've also brought in another hit of that brushed steel with one pendant light. This is a halogen pendant. And as you can see, it just creates a pool of light right in the perfect area of the workstation here. And it's on a dimmer. So if you're working in the evening, the office doesn't have to be really glowing from the street. And then you'll see that for the cats to be able to look out the window and also to have a place to spread out with paperwork, we've built in this low, almost, it's almost like a banquette actually, but not designed for sitting on and it also has file drawers here along the bottom. We've dressed this radiator on this side by covering it over and what we've done is we've used a decorative punched steel panel to sort of disguise the rad but still make sure that we get enough heat in this room in the winter and we've even managed to eke out a couple of little cabinets on either side. The amount of storage that I got for the openness of the office is incredible. I mean, I've got more filing cabinets that I need, and the desk space is perfect. Everything's great. Very happy. This is a really inviting, cozy, 
masculine inspired office as a really great offshoot to the lounge area and I know that I would like to be a guest for dinner so I could spend the evening hours relaxing in there. I'm Sarah Richardson. I hope you'll join me next time on Room Service. Welcome to Room Service. I'm Sarah Richardson. Have you ever dreamed of creating your very own summer camp cabin dressed in funky grown-up style? Well, it's a challenge, even for me, as we transform this messy place into a riot of color and fun by adding exotic eastern accessories that brighten the darkest summer sky, some soft accents of chenille to increase the comfort factor, and say hi to 60s style with our very own tie-dyed linens. We're making this shack all about kicking back, and it's only on room service. designers love a challenge and I'm certainly no exception but I also know what you're thinking right now because you're looking at this and you're thinking to yourself Sarah you're talking about a shack and I know that but I believe that any space can be turned into something fantastic all you need is a really good plan Now, let's be honest, I don't have any sort of delusions of grandeur that this is going to become some sort of palace. And many people would have just torn this down, writing it off and thinking it was far too terrible to even deal with. But I think that it could be turned into something like a summer camp cabin. Now, it's sort of made up of two separate rooms. Right now, it's just being used for storage. We've got styrofoam insulation and bags here, and there's doors and shutters and windows over there. Not too much in here, though. Originally, this was actually the refrigerator area and it has a tin floor and it even has this thick door that attached here and sort of allowed it to be cold storage. I'm thinking we could just take out this wall which sort of looks like it's crumbling anyway. Now as for this area, if you're thinking summer camp cabin, well then it's sort of cot beds and it's really simple. It's hooks underneath the shelf for where you're going to store all your stuff. A couple of beds here, sort of twin size beds. I'm thinking one can run this way and another can run along this side. It'll create sort of an L-shaped uh, area. Let's call it sort of a prehistoric sectional sofa. That's what I'm thinking. And this can be just a really great place to lounge and relax. This window opens up to the west. It has a wire contraption here that just holds it up. And I love this sort of shutter idea that they just drop down here. We need to replace the window on this side. And then we'll have plenty of light coming through and lots of cool breezes, which is a good thing to consider when you're talking about the summer. You want a place you can get out of the heat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint it up. I'm thinking, listen to that creaky door. I'm going to whitewash all of the walls and the ceiling, get rid of the wasps' nests. That will be one of our first priorities. And then simple furnishings, really inexpensive. We're going to find some great treasures, work on them. I'm thinking color, and most importantly, this place is all going to be about having fun. Our favorite memories of that all-too-short season called summer center around sunny days, warm breezes, and the joy of being outside, like the freedom of running through a field of wildflowers or the childhood memory of splurging your allowance on penny candy, so bright and happy you just can't resist. Summer fun is about casual ease and taking time to play, drawing lines in chalk on the sidewalk or slipping on sandals to head to the beach and spend the day in the surf. If you were wondering what sort of direction I was going to take for a summer cabin, well, I decided to just go all out, fun, bold, and colorful. And I'm standing here surrounded by walls of pillows and comforters, and this all just screams fun. It has a sort of Eastern influence, something that's really popular in home decor now. We're seeing this sort of a bohemian, eclectic, a lot of mixing of textures and colors. So you can see here, we've got a bedspread that has pinks and reds and 
and yellows and greens all pulled together. Now this doesn't have to be just for a summer look, but it is a great way to think about bringing some bold color into your home. Look at this. These are all really just sort of trendy pieces, things that are not too expensive, which is a good focus if you're thinking about doing something that is more of a trendy look. You want to focus on how do you get the look, but how can you do it at a reasonable price point that doesn't break the bank so that you feel committed to it for years to come. These are beaded placemats. These would be great for a holiday table or just to use for special occasions. You could set them off against white dishes and they would just look so sparkly and fun. We've also got an entire wall here of over 200 different types of pillow cushion covers. So if you get frustrated with me always telling you to make cushions, instead you can go out and buy your own which already have a border around them. Here's some terrific ones and I think these would really lend themselves well to the color scheme that we're planning on going with here in shades of pink and lavender and just bright happy colors. Another thing you might want to think about an easy way to bring in a more eclectic look, something colorful, sort of um, Indian inspired. Hold on a second. Oh, tripping over things back here. Oh. Yes, now there's a collection of small boxes on the ground. Uh, these are organza drapes, and people often refer to things like this as being sari fabric. Well, sari actually relates to a garment that is worn, and it means that it's made of five meters of fabric. So you may find some of these fabrics actually sold as saris, but these are just made for the purposes of being turned into home accessories. So look at these beaded organza drapes. There are tablecloths, pillow covers, bedspreads, accessories, beaded boxes, jeweled purses, these incredible lanterns that have a tassel hanging at the bottom. I think we're definitely going to have to take a couple of those with us and everything you need to bring that eclectic, colorful, happy and wonderful look to your home. If the first time you saw this building you thought all it needed was to be bulldozed and taken down, then I'm going to prove you wrong and show you what you can do just by painting and doing some simple fix-ups. And I think we are on our way to making tremendous improvements in this little cabin. First thing we did was we cleared out all of the junk and that was a pretty big undertaking. We took out the wall that used to separate this room from the other one, which also had a really thick refrigerated door. Then I had the fabulous task of ripping up an old tin floor, which I think had been nailed down with about a thousand nails. So my work gloves came in handy for that. And then we painted and painted and painted. It took us eight gallons of paint to do walls and ceiling. And we chose sort of a creamy color. You'll notice there is still a little bit of staining coming through. And that's something that you may find even if you use a good primer in an old building like this. The roof boards just had, I guess they'd had moisture in them over the years. So we've decided just to go with it. And I think it makes it sort of feel more like a Florentine plaster or a whitewash that you'd see at a house in France. Anyway, I think it's great and it's rustic. That's the point. We are not trying to make this really glamorous at all and it is not going to be fussy. It's just going to be fun and that is the most important thing. We brought in a couple of new windows. These are actually new old windows. They are salvaged but as you can see it brings in so much light and they're nice and low down. It, this one used to just be boarded up and this had a really terrible sliding window. We've got flies, hornets, wasps, everything in here today. It's summer. We love it. Uh, we left the old hinged window because I just love the way that just opens up and looks right onto the field. So it again needs lots of paint. As you can see, I'm starting to pull together a little bit of a concept here with the furnishings slowly. We've got some pieces that we picked up at flea markets like a drop leaf table. I've got this funky chair that I got at a salvation store and painted it in hot pink. It's not a style of chair that I would normally choose, but we thought it would just be so whimsical in this room. It would be a great addition. I found this um, old bamboo easel, which made me start thinking, well, if this is a camp cabin for grown-ups, then it should be sort of like an artist's retreat, a place to come and paint watercolors or big canvases. So I don't know, that's where I'm going with that now. And as for the lounging and sleeping element, I whacked together, literally whacked together, some very rustic little cot bases. Um, just using some old salvaged plywood and they're going to kind of go in this position here. We're going to dress them so you don't see the wood frames underneath. It's all simple and it's all fun and it is going to be the greatest little summer shack.
Okay, let's say that you need eight gallons of paint to cover the walls and three gallons for the floor. That adds up to 11 gallons and the total is a pretty hefty price tag at the paint store. So if you're trying to tackle a large area and you want to do it on a budget, here's something you might want to consider. Most paint stores keep their mist tints and those are the custom tinted gallons that they made a mistake on and they sell them off at a substantial discount. What I would suggest is getting a collection of similarly colored mist tints. So if you want to do something like this, make sure they're all light creamy colors, dump them all together in a bucket, mix them up well, and you will have enough paint to cover your project at a fraction of the price. Sandra Buchanan and her sister-in-law, Snez, know the value of mixing the old with the new. Using vintage chenille blankets, they've created home accessories that turn old linens into modern treasures. We came up with the idea of using the vintage chenilles just by actually stumbling across a whole bunch of them. A friend of ours didn't know what to do with them, and we thought, what a great idea. We should be able to reinvent chenille and bring it into today's marketplace and let our kids play with chenille toys and have them throughout our house again, just like we did with our grandmothers and our aunts and our uncles. Some of the items we create with our vintage chenille are mostly animals, bunnies, giraffes, lambs, dolls. We even go through pillows for general home use. We have quilts that people can use as throws. To find the old chenille blankets, Sandra and her sister-in-law use pickers all across North America. They find blankets at garage sales and flea markets or anywhere else antique linens can be found. These treasures come in a variety of colors and styles. Basically, when we get a bed cover, a vintage chenille bed cover, let's say we have this one, what we would use on this is pull the flower from this and use it somewhere along on a bear or a bunny. This one is a popcorn chenille. It's also it's another type of chenille that's used primarily for the body of a rabbit, let's say, or the neck of the giraffe. So you can get the polka dot idea on the animal as well as the fabric. This is a top quality chenille. You can see the tight knit of the chenille. You can use every aspect of this. You don't just have to work around the decorative part. You can use the entire bed cover. When we put a piece together, what we're looking at is color combinations and combining our fabrics. So if we have a really hobnail type chenille, you want to maybe put it with more of a small print floral in order to pick up on each other. And the colors, you're basically pulling from the floral print because that's where your range of colors are from in order to pick what chenilles you're going to use. Having any one of these chenille items in your home just makes any room feel wonderful. You feel the warmth. You can just, when you're sitting on the couch and you're brushing up against a pillow, it just makes you feel nice and warm. I said before that I wanted the little shack to end up feeling like a camp cabin, so I figured the only thing to do is start playing around with some arts and crafts. So in front of me here, I have a whole bunch of pails of dye. Now I'm using fabric dye to do tie-dyed sections of fabric that I will sew up into accessories that I'll use throughout the room. And we're talking sort of candy shop colors. I have a vat of, it's hard to tell because they're um, more intense. I've got lilac, I've got red, I've got turquoise, and I've got yellow. The fabric that I'm using, I've used two different things. First of all, I tried using some old pillowcases, just old white cotton pillowcases, and I'm also using some white twill. And this is just really inexpensive twill that you can get at any fabric store. You usually pay anywhere from about four to eight dollars a yard for it. And all I've done is I'm, I'm ripping it into sections to make more manageable pieces. Now, obviously, if you were an expert tie dyer, you could uh, do something like a bedspread or curtains even but it's been a very long time since I've done this so I decided I should start small. What I'm doing is I'm cutting my pieces of fabric into about 24 inch pieces to 30 inch pieces. I'm just ripping them and then I'm gonna fold that piece of fabric in half again and this will end up giving me enough coverage to do the face of a pillow. There we go. 
The other thing is I want the designs to be very, very simple. And as you can see here, I've been experimenting mostly just using stripes. And I've got the very clear colors that I've used instead of dipping them into multiple vats of dye. So I'm starting out by just sort of pleating the fabric as I go, just to keep that edge straight. And then I am using and I'll just make sure that it's all perfectly straight at the top. I'm using jute string. And the number of times that you wrap the string around the fabric will determine the width of the band. So if you want really subtle bands, you could just wrap it around a couple of times. And if you want a really wide band of that white fabric showing through, you can wrap it around more. Generally about six to eight is what I've been doing so far. It's all tied. I'm just going to trim off these ends and I'm on to the fun part, which is dyeing. I'd recommend using gloves, some rubber gloves, regular kitchen gloves. And I'm going to try the turquoise. So just set it in the bath. Okay, now after it's been sitting for a minute, I can pull this out and I'm going to live on the edge here. I'm going to dip it into the lilac. Come on over here, we'll see what happens. This could be good, it could be bad. You'll be my witness. Oh, it's kind of more periwinkle blue. Then you can just squeeze out the extra and leave it on the line just for a minute to let some of it drip off. Now the other thing I've done is I've tied up some pillowcases. And this one I've done so I'll have rings going around it. Let's try this in the red. I'm going to dip this one into the purple too. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. Okay, now I'm just taking this one out of the purple. Look at this, it's gone sort of a raspberry color. Now, let's try cutting some of these off and see how they've turned out. Let's see how this one turned out. Oh, look at that. I love the effect of these stripes. Now, I'm no expert on tie dyeing, but I think that all of these will add a really light-hearted, summery feel to our little shack. These pretty painted glasses are sometimes called swanky swigs, and they're hot collectibles. They first appeared in the 30s and were designed as double-duty jars for foods like peanut butter or mustard. They come in a huge variety of shapes, sizes, and colors with various themes from flowers to cartoon characters. Swanky swigs are inexpensive to collect, but some are more valuable than others. Look for pieces in mint condition with a bright, clear design and an unusual theme. My summer cabin is all finished, and I hope you think it's as much fun as I do. It's now dressed in all of these vibrant shades of pinks and reds and lilacs, and it's sort of all blended together like an intense summer sunset sky. I think that's really the perfect description of all the colors that are in this room. Now, one of the things I have to talk about is, of course, our project, our tie-dye project. What could be easier? What could be more fun? And here are the pillows that I made from all of those panels, and I've just sort of matched them up. Doesn't matter if they're not the same color on both sides. So we've got purpley pink with reddy pink, and two different sort of shades of pinky purples paired up together. Then we just used a white twill piping just to tie in the lighter, the background color that was in the original fabric. And this is such a simple project, a great thing to do with kids. It is 
within the budget, especially if you're using remnant fabrics. And that's something that we really used throughout this room was remnants of all different elements that I had lying around. So we had an old sari, this was from a costume party, and it has now been turned into these drape panels, which will probably fade over the years because they're in this direct sun, but I'm definitely okay with that. The leftover fabric from the sari was turned into a couple of pillows, of course, some hits of chenille inspired by the artist that we went to visit. Then we brought in some sort of pinky red shades and that's dressing these two cot beds. Now you'll remember the platforms were rough but fully executed. They look terrific. We've done a very simple bed skirt. Then we have uh, another red tone, sort of a warmer orangey red, again in linen, that's just covering a slab of foam that's on each bed. Four inch thick foam, it's 30 inches wide by about 75 inches long. Now, this is not something the right size for everyday sleeping, but I figure this is only used for occasional sleeping and it's great for lounging because we've set them up in this shape, this sort of L shape, which makes it feel like a sectional sofa. We've got little white quilts rolled up at the foot of the bed for cool nights. Then we have a little table here to act as the bedside table, some beaded candle holders adorning the walls, these neat lanterns, one hung in this room, the other one is hung in our artist's studio and a few accents here and there just to tie our whole concept together. Since we didn't have enough sari fabric to do both windows we decided to go with seersucker on this window. Then we have our mosquito netting which kind of makes it like a princess's bed back here and then I found this Killeen carpet at an auction. I got it for about $125 and it again just pulls together our entire color scheme. In our little studio at the end we found an old work table. It's just a sort of folding trestle table made out of oak and now it is set up to be the craft table or the painting table and an inspirational canvas of peonies sits on our old easel and the best part about this is this is just relaxed, it's laid back and it's everything that a summer cabin should be. I'm Sarah Richardson and I hope you'll join me next time on Room Service.